fast track. We're, we're a one product company, so uh, we only do uh, this one product, which is a, a GRC product, obviously. And we concentrate in the enterprise area, so most of our customers are, are large organisations by Australian standards, probably medium to large by US standards. Um, the company itself, we're a Microsoft certified partner, so all our software is Microsoft uh, platform based, so uh, it's a .NET product, runs on um, a SQL Server, so we don't run on Linux or other, or, um, other database type systems. Uh, probably not a big issue to you, but we're ISO certified as uh, most people would expect um, here and probably in Europe. Yeah, Europe. And the, our biggest claim to fame, I guess, is we've been supporting or um, uh, working with the uh, Australian Department of Defence since 2000, so whatever that is, 16 years now. And to get to that level uh, requires the software to be, um, well, they go through about 18 months worth of testing for performance and security and sociability, um, all that type of stuff. So just shows that the software is... Um, is strong and they've maintained it for a long period of time. How old is the company, Greg? Um, <laughs> dirty question. Um, 30 years. No, oh, 30, 81, 35 years. Software was developed in the early 90s. Um, we were in uh, early days, we were in manufacturing, and out of that, we uh, grew a quality component which then grew into risk which then grew into GRC so there's been a kind of over the long period of time a migration from where we started to what the, what the company and product is today and obviously the software has been redeveloped. Company wise you can see here um, some big uh, company names Motorola, Serco and uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff you would probably know um, more recently big companies over in the US as well Utilities like SA Water, which is South Australia Water, um, Aquis, which is our um, quarantine and inspection service. So, you know, they, they do all the border type security. Healthscope is probably our largest private health company here. Not, not insurance company, but operator. So they operate hospitals and uh, pathology and those type of areas. Um, Yokogawa is a, a big uh, Japanese company that does fluid control systems uh, for you know petrochemical and water and all that type of stuff. So just a selection of companies we have. Um, we tend to specialise uh, in areas which uh, we refer to as mission critical or safety critical. Um, that's just from a market point of view where um, uh, risk is a uh, an operational need not a um, good business practice. Um, so that, that's the reason why we've um, concentrated in that area. Okay. Uh, Software-wise, we provide our software either um, on-premise or in the cloud. Uh, from a cloud point of view, we offer it through Microsoft Azure as the uh, hosting agent. The software is identical, so um, people uh, can either choose either and they're going to get exactly the same product. Uh, it's purely a delivery, delivery method. Uh, and it comes back to a costing and a um, uh, you know, management issue internally in the company. Uh, in Australia, you probably wouldn't be aware, but there's a, and probably overseas generally, there's a, a fairly big concern about um, the US Patriot Act and um, data sovereignty. So uh, a lot of organisations, especially government in Australia, all require that data is warehoused in the country. And uh, as you okay. does. Sorry, say again. Just like you were? Yes. Sorry, Greg, let me ask you a question that, that's actually related to something else that I'm working on. Yeah. Are you seeing, I guess, and, you know, and I don't want you to reveal anything proprietary, but can you tell me what the percentage is between cloud and on-premises, and is it and how is it changing? Um, in our marketplace, it's um, probably 90-10 uh, to on-premise. I'm sorry, 90 cloud? No, 90, 10, uh, 90 on-premise, 10% cloud. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if it's Australia, our, our marketplace or what, but um, there, there is a huge aversion to going to the cloud with uh, uh, GRC software in Australia anyway. 
you're looking at two things. You're looking at its uh, you know, company objective and strategic intelligence and also its negativity. So the um, you know, risk is you know, a big part of risk from our point of view and in our clients is uh, incident management. You know, to be able to manage risk, you have to know uh, what is actually happening in your, um, in your environment. And having those two things susceptible to external um, access is abhorrent to um, most senior type of management. Microsoft is, is trying to blitz them all the time about saying, you know, their security is better than um, what they would have in the house anyway, um, all that type of stuff. But uh, it, it's a psychological issue, I think. And when it comes to cost-wise, um, the cost of the cloud in our field is is not real relevant, especially here. Um, and like I'm saying, in the mission critical type of area, people really don't want to do it. Um, I would say 60% of the prospects would ask about cloud, and hence why there's a slide here. Uh, but when it gets to decision time, um, it normally goes away. You know, they want it as an option, but they don't want it as a solution. I, I find that really fascinating because I, you know, when you talk about risk, you know, to me there's obviously an element of security in it, and with, you know, at least in, in the United States and Europe, I, you know, it may be with the Australian government as well. You know, they're always coming up with new regulations. So having someone to focus on, you know, we're always going to update the regulations in our software for you, as opposed to you having to do it yourself. You know, I just I just think that that's a, a real strong argument. So I'm 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 somewhat surprised to hear you know what you're what you're describing there. Yeah, well, we're a bit different in I guess uh, what we're offering. Uh, we don't offer content, so we don't update the the regulations in the software. Oh, interesting. Okay. So we're we're offering a tool, and this comes back to the, this idea um, of uh, not being able to have real niches, I guess, in Australia. So we're operating in health, we operate in defence, aviation, mining and utilities. So, uh, and both, they're, they're all got you know, separate sets of uh, regulations and standards that they're dealing on. Our software um, has the ability for them to update their own. So, you know, we have an easy method of uploading from Excel spreadsheets, the uh, you know, any revisions of standards and stuff like that, but they, uh, they manage that themselves. Okay. As I mentioned, defence. Um, now, if, even in defence, and you'd probably be used to it if you've dealt with defence over there, um, defence is almost an industry. In our case, we deal with logistics, uh, aviation, and uh, explosive ordnance are the main areas we deal with in defence. But again, obviously, they're, they're quite diverse in nature and standards and regulations as well uh, on that. Software-wise, one of our big Claims to fame is that we've got a comprehensive suite of solutions. So you've got your enterprise risk and governance, but we also then uh, support that with quality, which is the ISO 9000, environmental management, OHS type of thing. So the other management systems that actually support your UGR system, we also can offer as well from an operational level. And more to the point, um, I guess one of our claim to fames is we have risk endemic right through the whole suite. So we actually hold risk down at, you know, on individual contracts or people or equipment or whatever else. So uh, it's managed at a, at a detailed level and not as a standalone register, uh, which is what most other people do, which um, personally we don't believe is effective. So that comes to basically this slide, which is basically saying we see risk as an overriding um, management functionality, not a product or a, a module in itself. Um, although we do sell a much more risk. But we, we see the, the oversight, the, the governance side, as in, important as incident management and your improvement. So they refer to it as enterprise risk management, but it's generally it's not enterprise. And generally it doesn't manage risk, it just records it or administrates it. So we cover the, the, the suite. So uh, I'm sorry, before, I'm sorry, before we go on, so are you, are you seeing, I mean, because, you know, when we look at, you know, enterprise risk management, governance, risk, and compliance. Risk is always right there in the middle. Yes. And, you know, my sense is that, you know, you, you have control over your governance and you have control over your compliance. I mean, you know what the compliance laws are. Our risk is the one that's kind of, it's the fuzzy one. And so um, how does that kind of, you know, when you talk about, 
you know, risk being all the way through your, your suite yeah. um, is, you know, and, and that you do equipment and, and people at a highly detailed level. Is it, is it a little bit, Greg, if you would, about, you know, how that works operationally? I mean, as opposed to just, you know, um, you know, we think this is a risk and we're tracking it, which is what you said. You said most people just manage it. Tell me a little bit about how how what your people are what your either what your software does or what your customers are doing is different from an operational risk standpoint. Um, the the operational risk is managed down at the the real operational level, not the the risk management. Oh, can I come back to that? Let me. Sure, I've only, sure. only got two more slides to do, and uh, then I'll. No, jump. Fine. Okay. I, I, want to, I want to throw you off. It's just a topic that Leslie and I both find really fascinating. So yeah, please well, continue. Well, that's going to be probably the uh, the the topic really of, of my demonstration anyway, because um, that's what right. we see as being the, the big difference. Yeah, so it, the idea is to keep the the cover all areas of it, such that at the end of the day, obviously, you know, everyone knows about ERM and the fact that it should be oriented to driving your your objectives of your business. So I won't waste the time on that. Um, now, this is the last thing I just want to go through before we jump into the software is um, our big difference and the fact that um, the way we manage data. Traditionally, most systems manage data in database tables, which uh, we're all used to. And what it means is that you will have a table of, in this case, risks, a table of people, a table of equipment, a table of customers, and you've got all these individual tables. Risk is really a inter, um, interrelationship between your customers and your products and all that, and that they can all affect them differently. So we don't see managing of risk in the, in the traditional silo method as being a, 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 a realistic way of um, trying to ascertain what's happening on. So we came up with a, a different method, which um, is the neural network method, where basically we store data as discrete objects, and we then have relationships. Now, I'm not talking about database relationships. I'm talking about real-world relationships. So we store relationships as data. And that allows us to have multiple relationships between uh, items, so um, the many-to-many -many links. It allows us to combine things multiple ways and look at things different ways. So that's the big difference that w we see in putting it all together. So you don't need to go into a customer to find out about customer information. You can go into anywhere, and if it's related, it'll um, be included in it. It's a big topic, but to uh, actually probably show you is more important. So getting to what we were talking about before, here we've got a uh, the front screen of Fast Track, and these are the modules that we offer, as I mentioned earlier on. There's mm -hmm. your corporate governance and risk side, and bring in your compliance um, audit type of area as well, uh, knowledge management skills, contracts, and equipment. We tend to find this the equipment and uh, the contracts are a big driving part of, uh, of the whole risk area. So basically the data collection areas. So this comes into what you're asking about how do we see this working. So the easiest thing is, I'll, let me jump into operational, so I drop into contracts. So basically any of the modules we go into, and then you can choose the sub-module uh, here. We then have a series of libraries, which is hierarchical. So all this is user-definable. I'll go into our contracts, and I've got a series of contracts here, my contract register here that have come up. So if I jump onto a contract, uh, I've got a whole lot of contract information up here, which I won't bore you with. But down the bottom is basically we have the ability to um, have our risks. Okay, so basically in this case here, we're looking at a contract, and as part of the contract management, uh, people will go through and do a, a risk assessment as they normally would do, um, and the risk is actually then tied back to the contract. And as part of the management of that contract, the risk is reviewed. So this is where the first big issue we see is most um, risk assessments people do become filing agents. So they, they carry it out at the start of a contract or a project, and they work out what they are and what they're going to do about it, and then it's left. Uh, under our system, we build in automatic reviews, uh, which are all diarised, so people get emails saying it's time to review it. They come in out of that, and then they can have a look at the... Uh, a particular risk in this case here, um, financial um, uh, viability of the, the company is a risk, 
and I've got risk calculators which are all configurable and all that type of stuff. So if I come into it, I can then change it and say if this company is looking shaky as their contract manager, I can come in and say, okay, it's most likely they're going to have problems with them. It'll change it, the rating to a high, you know, through normal risk calculator type functionalities. And that will then fire a, a traffic light, basically. Um, so it's now got a yellow light against this. Now, what we've also done through this is we then have built a tree of relationships between, this is using this neural model, where we can feed in um, uh, contribution factors, um, the way things uh, uh, roll up in the trees on it. And what that will do is, all right, so I've now got a yellow light on this contract. It would have sent a, a, an email to the, um, to the contract manager saying, hey, we've got an issue um, with this contract. Can you look at it? But more to the point, um, if I go into my governance area and look at my objectives, I've now got a traffic light on, on this on this objective and as the owner of this objective I would have also got a an email saying okay this objective has got a threat to it now. So and that comes from this neural mapping that we've got. So these relationships are all um, pretty sort of graphically identified here on the on the system. So the way the way the system gets structured is I've got a strategic objective like linked to a uh, tactical one that comes down to, I've got a KPI here on it, and um, so if I drill so you can on, drill down to any of these and find out what the yellow lights are referring to. That's right. So if I click on that, I can jump on its map, and uh, I can then see I've got, following it down further, I can see the prime contract here. I can then jump into it where I came and look at the risks on it. Um, and down and through. So as a director now of the business or a senior executive in the course of you know, 30 seconds, um, I've got down to where the things are. I can then check out what the controls I've got on that were or are and what the situation on those, um, who's managing them and all that type of stuff. I can look up other information on it. That's the big, big issue we see. So as opposed to having a risk register, obviously, um, they all start with risk registers, but this ability to link things, um, if I go into this here, basically uh, we've got this related business here. Um, this is the detail that comes out of the neural network. And basically any time you've got a, a drop-down list on a screen, Fast Track identifies it's a drop-down list. It has to be a relationship of some sort, so it will actually build a relationship for that. So it's always linking things together. It links things two ways. So if it links a, a risk to a piece of equipment, it also lists the equipment back to the risk. So you're actually generating more uh, relationships all you know, across the system. I can link things manually as well, um, as I notice. So in the course of carrying out a, a job, if I notice something, I can put it in or if I'm carrying out an audit and I notice something's affected something, I can link it. So what we're trying to do is drive the ERM system from an operational perspective. So the information, to, to us traditionally what happens is ERM's driven top down. Um, your senior executives say we want an ERM system and they, then you've got CRO uh, structures, a whole system and then your managers go and set what they see things to be. Again, it's a, a potential. What we want to do is drive it with actuals that are occurring. That's what I was saying earlier on about the incident management. We also drive a lot of the actuals through incident management, linking back through to our um, um, risks. I guess talking around it, but if we look at risk itself. So the way, way we run it is that um, Obviously, you've got your risk registers. You know, again, this are all user-definable hierarchies and stuff. We're also big into scenario analysis as well. So if I look at one of these in particular, I then have... So I've got a, a traditional, um, in this case here, a, uh, a situation of um, a whole lot of things that can occur on that, but I can then go and uh, assign controls and do mappings and all that onto it. But then what we can do is we can then have incidents and that related back to 
to those. So I've got this risk here. It's coming down to a, a business development project which has you know, plans and such off it. Links it back to our policy so we can see the context of it. Um, so what we're trying to do, and obviously you've got your drivers and um, controls, you know, basic um, nuts and bolts of a risk management system linked into it. But more than, more than, so this is where we see most people put all their effort in doing all this. Um, to us, how this really affects all the other things that are, that are going on in your business from the management is really the whole point of risk. And so this is where, where I'm talking more GRC than I'm talking ERM all the time. Uh, ERM to me is kind of like BI, business intelligence. You know, having a business intelligence system in itself doesn't really make a lot of sense unless it's actually there to serve a purpose, which is to you know help you grow your your business. Um, to mm -hmm. me, ERM's the same, um, and too many people treat it as a, an art for art's sake. You know, in uh, I'm sorry, too many people treat it as a what? Art for art's sake. It's, okay. That's not an American term. Art for art sake means you're doing it for its own purpose. Where most people say, you know, it's an ERM system. They've got this wonderful ERM system and it's doing all these wonderful things, but it's not actually driving anything in the business. Well, that's a really interesting point because one of the things that Leslie and I are trying to figure out in this report is, you know, are people using this to be, you know, using ERC or ERM to be reactive or to be proactive or to even be predictive? Well, exactly, <laughs> and that's one of my. Well, big... no, but I think a lot of people are still doing it to be reactive. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, a lot of people, and it's, um, uh, I guess, the bugbear of our sales, <laughs> is um, fighting people who want to just tick boxes, and they want to set it up and forget about it. Whereas for it to work, it has to actually be part of your management decision making functionality. So you have to actually use it as a tool to help your managers uh, perform functions. And that's what we're trying to do here, is we're um, giving people context and um, information. So um, whether you're dealing, you know, if you get a, a letter from a customer, you can go into the customer and um, let me just do that. So we've got establishments we deal with. Um, jump into, I've got a list of companies here, and if I look at their map, I can find everything that uh, affects that customer, uh, in this case here, from where they operate, legislation that's involved in what they do, their personnel, you know, what verification work we're doing on them, uh, and then drill down on those, and I can find out where we've got problems, you know, customer complaints or equipment and such used, and I've got a problem here, I can then drill down on it and see um, what its map is, and work through the further on through that. Um, so as a manager now, not as a risk manager, but just as a, a normal operational manager, I'm looking at something to do with what I do on a daily basis and finding out information about it. Again, in the, the mission critical area, you, you don't want the, the gut feel and business is becoming that complex that these maps are showing, and this is only a demo system. Sorry, I'm probably I'm sorry. jumping on the high it's horse so Yep. Thought. Business is so complex, what? Oh, uh, it's a whole book. I mean, there's the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, that covers it. Um, gut feel in modern complex business isn't isn't right. In small business, the, the, the view that a, uh, you know, a small business manager has that they know everything that's going on in the business when they're making decisions doesn't hold when you get to large organisations. And mm -hmm. uh, with that, there's been a propensity uh, in recent times to move to a more flatter business hierarchical structure, uh, which is ending up giving managers wider areas of responsibilities, uh, and therefore the level of complexity that they have to manage has, has grown dramatically. Not having A, the information, and B, it visually available to them when they're making decisions means that they make a very biased, and again, there's lots of books being written recently on bias and management decision making, that it, you know, the bias isn't um, overt, it's not done for any specific, specific reasons, but it's done because people just can't fathom all of that information, and that's what we're trying to do with this mapping, is give people a visual look that even when they're making simple decisions, they don't need them to even 
drill down on any of this information is that the, they've got a, a, a mental thing to know what they've got to uh, take into consideration. And this is when they start using their ERM systems. Um, again, <laughs> traditionally I, I keep finding people with ERM systems and the, uh, apart from when they have to be reassessed, people aren't looking at those risks. Um, you, you must have come across it in IT. I mean, I, this is where I, I first really found it staggering is um, IT projects almost invariably will do a risk assessment at the start of the project, but through the course of the project with all the problems that occur, no one ever goes back to those, those um, risk assessments. You know, um, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> And uh, I, I have sat in uh, numerous project meetings where you know, I've raised the fact that you know, these issues were raised at the start as part of the risk assessment and um, you know, people never took them into consideration and obviously the risks came to fruition. But, um, Greg, let me ask you a question. Yep. I mean, one of the issues that we keep running into is because GRC or ERM is so, you know, touches every part of the company, that it's, it's kind of, you know, because it is an enterprise tool, gee whiz, it's sometimes hard to get people to buy into it because they're, you know, they're, they have a lot of, of um, what's the word I'm looking for? They have a lot of fatigue about boil the ocean projects. How do you get around that? How do you get around that? <laughs> Again, because we, we, we focus on the operational level, we see the greatest returns and the greatest knowledge um, stored in the um, people on the shop floor, basically. I mean, that's going to an exaggeration. But um, your, your supervisor level, not your manager level, so if you go below your, your manager level, um, they're the mushrooms, is uh, the guys who actually do all the work and know all the problems but are ignored by their management. Um, and we've found that by, if you go to those guys, and we do it through uh, spreadsheets, so lots of our information is uploaded through spreadsheets. Uh, we've got standard ways of doing this. So we disseminate spreadsheets throughout this, uh, the organisation. Um, and you'll find at that supervisory level, the guys who have the responsibility to get work through, but have the problems all the time, um, they're quite pro detailing it and putting it into the system. And the fact is there's um, something like Fast Track where they get this immediate response. They can see what they've done almost straight away. They, you know, they upload it and then they get the map in front of them. It helps them with the way that they relate to their, their managers. Whereas what you're doing with managers when you're implementing a lot of these systems is you're putting a lot more work onto them. If you're expecting them to come up with their risk registers and risk assessments, you know, the first thing you're going to do is turn around and say, you know, I want you to do 20 risk assessments. Um, you know, it's the last thing they need, especially considering they know that most of it's going to be filed and not used anyway. Um, so th that's how we get around it. We go down to the level where it does make a difference. Okay. Um, the other thing we find too is... No, let me ask you so when you're, you know, when you're selling, are, are you selling an enterprise license or C licenses? How does that, how does that work? Um, we do have an enterprise license, but to be honest, I don't think we've sold one to date. Um, even with Defence, Defence have got over 2,000 users, um, but they've bought them as multiple. So it's Sorry. just seat license? Yeah, so it's a seat license, basically. Basically, we, there's a two component to it. We sell it as, we sell a module license, which is a server license. So, um, yeah, a company will buy X number of modules, and they will pay, you know, a set amount per module one, one time. And then on top of that, they then purchase um, seat licenses to update the information in um, in each of those modules. Okay. And I'm sorry, Greg. I just while I'm thinking about it, so are you only in Australia, or or but you're not. You're in Japan. All right. So are you you're global then? Probably eighty, maybe eighty-five percent Australian. So we do have overseas clients. Yes, but. Majority of them are majority of clients are Australian. Put it that way, we haven't really actively marketed overseas. Um, people uh, have bought from us as opposed to us uh, marketing into different areas. Do you have we, plans to expand? I guess the answer to that's no. <laughs> um, would we like to? Yes, I, I guess. Probably the negative thing to say, and I probably shouldn't say it is, you know, we're comfortable where we are. So. 
Well, but it's you know it's you know and this goes back to this other this other project that I'm working on, which is the question of you know what is the value of being what is there a value and if so what is it of being not in uh, North America or Europe? Well, part of it is is that you get really really good at serving your home market. And when you get, you know, and then you use that traction to go elsewhere. You, you know, you may, you know, if we talk in two years, or when we when we talk in two years, you may have a completely different, you know, completely different attitude. You know, uh, you know, so it's, you know, you, you never know. But I think, you know, you can't, you can't be everywhere at once. What I'm trying to say, Greg, is, you know, what you're saying isn't necessarily negative. I mean, you really have to focus on your home market and get good at that, and only by doing that do you know do you have the, the foundation from which you expand. So I, I don't I don't necessarily think that what you're saying is a negative. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, again, um, I've obviously um, been around for a while, and my enjoyment in my business isn't money. I, I, you know, um, I enjoy my interaction with my customers. Um, yeah, we've only got thirty odd customers. I think I mean they're big companies, but. Um, by you know, international standards, it's a, a small customer base. You know, I, I enjoy I dealing with them. So. No, but I think that you know, the things that, that you're focusing on, I mean, you know, and this is based on you know my limited knowledge of, of, of Australia. You know, when you're talking about equipment management, I mean, what's what's one of the biggest industries in the country about mining? And it's you know often these places where if those things break down, everybody's you know the work stops. So being able to manage the risk when you know a big mining Piece of equipment is going to break down. I think it's a really key issue. So you know, again, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. No, well, and and the thing about Australia, um, probably you don't have it many other places in the world, but um, our the government regulator in mining is anti-mining. So we 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 don't have the third world situation where you can get away with murder, uh, but we don't have the pro-business um, attitudes that you have in the states. And mining inspectors walk into a mine trying to shut it down. Mining is very, very difficult in Australia from a, uh, a management point of view. Sorry, I digress. Um, no, that's okay, but it, makes, but it makes everything you do, you know, in terms of incident incident management, environment management, important because you can say, look, this is what we're doing. So, you know, that's, that goes back to what you were saying about, you know, auditing everything. We, we did have a, uh, an agent in South America. We just found it too hard because Again, the, their attitude was, again, I, I guess, um, you know, checking a box. They, they wanted to say they had it, uh, but they weren't interested in, um, in in trying to actually achieve anything out of it. And therefore, it came down to a price war every time. So in the end, we said, no, you know, that's our price and we can't afford to discount it. Let me ask you this. I just, I, I'm not sure what else you wanted to show me on the demo, but I, no. I want to I wanna get some of my questions in. So yep, what please, kind of quantitative or qualitative benefits are your customers reporting after they deployed your software? Well, one of our biggest reporting issues is we report in Excel, basically. So um, you can take a an Excel spreadsheet and Fast Track will populate it with data. So we've got a number of engines that do that through it. So it gives customers individual um, analysis, uh, quantitative um, uh, reporting type things. Um, generally, it's done in trending. Is probably the the biggest issue most of our customers are going. Um, they see management, especially of risk, as being a directional issue, not a uh, not a, a quantitative as such, um, which is a, Sorry, not a what as such. Quantitative. So people tend to want to generally in risk they want to give something a a, a score uh, and a value. And say so, you know the risk is X, Y, or Z. Um, most of our clients who are dealing in mission critical area are more d interested in the direction risk is going than what whatever the value of it is. So there's a thing called risk velo uh, velocity um, mm -hmm. they want to measure, and just the direction it's going in. It's that's where the, the reporting tends to be. In um, so that they'll do a trend. Uh, defense tends to work on a five-year trend. Business, other business outside that area would consider that too too long, um, so they prefer to look at shorter trends. Um, the other thing we do is that's why I called up the um, 
the dashboard here is we bring things back to what we call capabilities. Again, this is a defence concept where you've got uh, key capabilities in your business. So to operate your business, you've got, uh, again, defence use the, the seven, seven categories of um, capability from your people, or your equipment, whatever else. So what you can then do is score that effectively. So this is, these are just KPIs. What they're doing is uh, we've got a calculation behind each of these to monitor our level of uh, capability. Now, capability can be um, uh, stressed as well as underutilised. So, um, you know, basically 100% is your perfect. By measuring your, um, your throughput, and this is where you get things from your operational side of it is more important. So, um, this is where your incident tracking, your contracts and other task management really, um, you mm -hmm. monitor these. But um, try giving management that view as opposed to a risk view uh, gets them to feel um, where they need um, to concentrate their efforts. So there's that capability. And like I said, the other one is the trend. Um, which I don't know, just have surveillance activity. So this is just normal uh, risk management type concepts, where our risks are, the activity that's happening on it. So as far as management risk, you, you, you hit the nail on the head way back in early on the, where people are saying that they're kind of fed up with it and there's a lot of work they have to do for no reason. Um, and this comes back to the compliance side of it, um, managing it is just getting people to um, to do the assessments they've got to do, to do the updating they need to do uh, on a regular basis. And this type of graph is a normal type of graph you'll see. It'll go up and down all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And so when it goes down, compliance people put more pressure on people and it comes back up again and then it drops off. Um, that That's a fact of life. So there's times where customers have come back to you and said, you know, we bought this thinking we could do A, but we discovered that we can do B and C. You know, I always feel like really good, really good technology will give you more than than you, you know as you, than you expected as you work with it. I mean, does um, that happen with this? No. <laughs> um, it's a it's something we've talked about internally here. We talk about it quite regularly. Is um, we when 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 we sell a system we. Um, uh, we're providing a lot more than the expectation, the customer expectation is. Um, and um, you would expect we get the well factor um, once it's installed. But the well factor dissipates really, really quickly during the installation. It's, it's human nature, I guess. Um, and it, it does become a bit of a, a negative to our staff in here that you know, they've done this wonderful job on installing something and um, it's a, a ho-hum type of um, response you get from the customer saying, yeah, that's what we expected. Um, so, you know, their response is they just got what they paid for and mm -hmm. we think that we, we've done a lot more than they did. But uh, <laughs> um, it, it's the fact that I guess in the back of their head that they were looking for, I, I think we find this, a lot of people don't know really what they want. Um, I don't mean that from a normal IT. I know everyone in IT doesn't know what they want, but um, they don't even know what their goal is. I think when you get to ERM and GRC, um, people who buy our type of product as opposed to the, the you know, risk register type systems, we just want to tick a box, um, they want something that will make a difference to their business. And that's why they, they, that's why they select us out of the, the hordes that are there. Um, but uh, I don't think they really know what they want that difference to be. That, that they can't visualise where they want to be. They just know that they want something more than what's happening. So when we actually give them their more, they think, yeah, well, that's what I, I came to you for. Um, that's good. Better than them saying this isn't what I wanted at all. <laughs> no, well, that's one thing. Um, we've got a lot of clients from a long time ago. I mean, we've got, yeah, Motorola has been a client since 97, I think. 
uh, Defence to 2000. So we hold on to our customers. Um, and um, as you probably would have seen in the time you have, you know, the market's changed dramatically over even since 2000. Um, so, you know, we're always... So, I mean, this area here, the organiser resilience, that's a, a new field that we're just building in with the latest thing now, looking at our ability to... Um, Sorry? Who are you usually selling to? Is it IT or is it finance or is it operations or whom? Um, it's a mixture. Um, it, it's not finance. <laughs> uh, we, we don't sell to the um, banking and insurance area. Um, so uh, outside of that, we tend to f have finances being a, um, a as a bugbear, I guess. Um, a, our product isn't the cheapest on the market, and again, um, when you start talking, you know, straight ERM type systems, there are cheaper products, and therefore finance will turn around and say, "Why are you buying a more expensive product than we really need?" Um, the the real people we like to sell to is um, your C level, so. Um, so on any of these things we can come down, we can drill down, we can click on something and um, go down and look into it, and see what makes up those records, um, yeah, and then jump down. Okay, so would, it be, would it be the, the COO or the CEO or, um, I mean, somebody, you know, somebody must come to you with a problem. Um, the, I guess it would be COO would be common, but also CEO. Um, we tend not to sell, oh, sorry, I can't say that, we have two. Um, oh, it, it's, it's probably even across the board, to be honest, um, at that at sea level, depending on where their issue is. To be honest, one of the most common reasons for people buying our software is um, a, uh, a negative incident in their business or in their industry, one of the two. So it's mm -hmm. kind of... Um, locking the stable door after the horse is bolted. Um, we, we tend to get a lot of uh, interest um, when there's been, like I'm saying, I mean, at the moment, <laughs> with uh, with VW and Mitsubishi and um, in Australia, um, Target over here has uh, had some really bad corporate um, ethical situations in our, one of our big banks over here has as well. So at the moment, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, and again, because we're talking GRC, not just ERM, um, a lot of that focuses on the corporate governance side, or obligations and uh, ethical practices and such. Um, so we tend to find a lot easier to sell to senior management. Okay. So. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's no surprise there. Okay, good, great. So, uh, one last question, Greg, because I want to be cognizant of our time, and, and uh, you know, I know that your your day is just starting. Are, are your customers looking at, you know, when they're looking at all of the operational risk issues, do they ever look at anything, you know, like geopolitical risk, when they're thinking about potentially expanding somewhere or, or something like that? I mean, they, they think about... Um, you know, markets, not just from a financial point of view, but from a, a viability point of view? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, uh, uh, you know, there will be a strategic risk, and then we'll have uh, strategic plans we also have in our, uh, uh, in our uh, governance module as well. And that will always, uh, again, in Australia, we, we tend to... Um, from a customer point of view, tend to be um, export oriented, um, and if you go to New Zealand, especially, they're predominantly export oriented, and therefore, um, looking at markets uh, and currency, um, are you know is a, a big issue, big issue, um, and currently there's a lot of bad press here that's happened because of um, you know overseas bribery in Middle East and Asia, um, companies here like 
solid Australian companies have been caught uh, you know, handing out paper bags overseas and um, uh, so that's becoming quite a major thing because the government's even saying they're going to start um, uh, criminal charges against some of these companies. Uh, oh, that'll make them get this kind of software real darn quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, strategic risk is a, uh, a big issue. Um, problem I see from our perspective is uh, most companies, and again, I'll be careful what I say, but th there is a tendency to separate um, strategic from tactical risk. Um, th 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 a lot of companies are, are see them as two almost independent things, which I just... Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry. See them as independent. I didn't. I didn't hear the last thing you said. Oh, that's what I mean. Just independent. They they don't see the relationship between day to day operations to strategic planning. Uh, so they they manage them and treat them almost as a, a silo uh, in themselves. Mm hmm. So. Wonderful. So I'm, uh, you know, as, as I intimated in my last email, you know, we, uh, our, our, our schedule is, is fungible, but um, we're getting close to the end. If I have other questions, I'll, I'll contact you by email. But again, I really appreciate you setting aside the time to chat. Um, appreciate the demo and um, we'll go forward. All right. And yeah, if you want another dem for your, um, was it Leslie, was it? Oh. Yes, Leslie. Yeah. So if she wants uh, to, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I'd, I'd ask you to, you know, to commit more of your time. I think she'll be okay with my notes. Um, and if she has other questions, she'll contact you. So I, I think we're good. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Wonderful. And thank you. Hope, and um, wait to hear from you. Thanks, Howard. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Take okay. care. Bye bye.